Happy Monday morning. It's great to see all of you. And I want to welcome you to this Center for Missional Outreach call, an important call about uh, mental health and the ways that we as people of faith and church leaders can um, step into this space in this time. I, it was timely that uh, just yesterday in the Dallas Morning News, uh, Sharon Grigsby had a piece uh, in which she lifted up uh, what's been called uh, a second pandemic in terms of a mental health crisis and um, shared a statistic that was new to me, and that is that the state of Texas is ranked uh, 51st out of 51 states in the District of Columbia in terms of access to mental health resources. Um, and so in her piece, uh, Sharon Grigsby challenges uh, people in all sectors, uh, government, business, and the faith community uh, to step into this space and recognize that there is, there already was um, a great need and a gap in meeting that need, and that it's likely that that, that need is only going to grow um, in the coming weeks and months as folks continue to, to grapple with the impacts of uh, sheltering in place, of um, broad <coughs> illness, and, and loss of life in our communities and our nation and economic insecurity and all the different ramifications of this pandemic. And so, so I'm grateful to you to that you recognize that need as well and that um, you've made it a, a priority to be a part of this conversation. And hopefully we can be the beginning of an even broader conversation among our United Methodist um, churches and groups again, to step into this space in, in, a, in a bold way. So thank you for being on the call. Um, before I offer a prayer, I just want to lift up that um, the Center for Missional Outreach is, is not the only center that continues to offer uh, Zoom gatherings as a way to equip our local church leaders. And so there is another, uh, another Zoom call later this week I'm pulling it up now so I can give you the details. Uh, but the Center for Leadership Development is leading a call on May 12th. So I guess that's tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. on a related topic, actually, on laity Christian caregiving. And the focus is on laity. The uh, panelists are Stephen ministers and staff from First McKinney. And it's the goal of this call to equip um, lay people with tools to address issues of anxiety and grief and other kinds of things that, again, are emerging in our communities. So I um, want you to be aware of that. All right. So um, with that, uh, allow me to offer an opening prayer for us. And then I believe uh, Andrew Pfizer, our associate director for the CMO, is going to welcome some of our guests and, and, and uh, set the table for our conversation. So let us pray. O oh, good and gracious God, our great physician, the one who brings us hope and healing, body, mind, and spirit. God, we give you thanks for this new day, and we pray that you will open our eyes to see um, the opportunities for ministry and good work uh, that is in it. God, as we gather this day, we lift up to you uh, all those in our community and, and truly in our world uh, who have risen to this new day, but because of, of their own struggles, they're unable to recognize the hope and the light and the healing that is available, those for whom uh, a cloud looms overhead. God, we... Uh, we lift up uh, particularly women and children who, whose vulnerability has again come to the surface and who are experiencing domestic violence and abuse in these circumstances around the pandemic. And God, we lift up those just who are experiencing uh, some of the whole host of challenges, mental health challenges that um, we are learning or a part 
of, of this pandemic experience. God, may, may you give us the compassion and the courage and the wisdom to come alongside them and step into, um, into that need and that space in a way that will help us to be a part of your healing work and that will give you glory. Bless our conversation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Andy. And thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, and thank you to our uh, panelists who will help set the table uh, for our conversation this morning. Um, as I introduce them and as we dive into uh, a conversation about where um, they specifically are encountering the mental health impacts of 19, um, I'd love for you to be able to use your chat feature um, through Zoom to ask questions, uh, not only for the panelists, but questions about um, what you're really thinking about or uh, even mentioning some of the encounters that you're having in your own context. Um, both our panelists and um, then later uh, <laughs> Dr. Brad Schwal, who's here uh, on our uh, call as well, will be able to join us in offering some resources and thinking through some of the ways that we can be in ministry and a helpful presence uh, for those who are really struggling through this time. Um, so let's uh, begin as uh, by introducing our guests who are here with us this morning. I've got Pastor Velda Turnley, uh, if you'll wave, uh, wave at the crowd, uh, from St. Luke United Methodist Church, St. Luke Community United Methodist Church, and she is the pastor of discipleship, small groups, and prayer. Uh, Francis, Francis Smith Dean is the executive director of the Zan Wesley Holmes Jr. Community Outreach Center, uh, which you'll um, uh, know a little bit um, through the Fraser House uh, work that they do. Uh, Lori Kendick is the uh, licensed uh, clinical social worker who uh, works with the care ministry at Christ United Methodist Church in Plano, and Mike Flynn, who is the um, a pastor and is uh, a director of the care ministry there at Christ United Methodist in Plano. So we have a, a variety of contexts um, and we're hoping to hear a little bit more from them about what they're seeing. So, uh, you know, whoever is, is ready to share, um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about the mental health concerns that you've been encountering in your ministry context, are there are there trends that you're seeing right now? Uh, okay, well, Andrew, I think uh, you have me uh, to go first here. Um, good uh, morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, of course, we are seeing, um, I think, what our country is seeing, but I want to put it in the context of uh, our mental health ministry um, we have now been in existence for five years now at St. Luke. Um, we started out as an, an endeavor working with our Kingdom Families Ministries, and uh, we moved into a format that was around a discipleship um, and formation model. Uh, and so out of that came our Mental Health Support Task Force. And uh, that task force um, decided that we were gonna move forward with addressing um, the issues that were facing families through a kingdom families uh, model. So a model of ministry that says, whatever happens to one person in the family affects the entire family. And so we are seeing that right now through this COVID-19 um, related um, uh, pandemic. So uh, our marriage ministry has reached out to us uh, to engage us around what is happening with married couples, families, or all together in one household now. And um, th that sometimes puts a stress on moms and dads. Uh, children are trying to find their space where they were working through um, issues relating to virtual uh, learning at home. And so everyone is trying to find their place and space 
in that system that has now been really challenged based on all of the events that are happening in, in our world. So uh, what we have been doing, uh, we meet once a month uh, relative to our support group and educational component. And we've decided to, um, as we, uh, Dr. Bowie has said it, pivot in our pandemic. We're pivoting in such a way that we've moved everything, obviously, to our virtual learning space. But we've done that, uh, and, and when we did that, we saw that our numbers grew uh, three times uh, relative to what we were having in our face-to-face -face environment. So the stigma that sometimes comes with uh, mental health um, has now allowed us to be able to reach people who may not want to be seen. Uh, so they're on, they're on the Zoom call and some of them choose to be silent. So we realized that we're, immediate, we're meeting the needs of people through our educational component and our support component. So we have switched all of our, we had a schedule that was mapped out for 12 months to address all of the issues that relate to mental health. But um, since the pandemic, we have changed our format to, and our topics to reflect everything relating to COVID. So we did uh, some anxiety work. Uh, we, we have been dealing with depression. Uh, we have invited some of our young people uh, into our space. We, uh, we are working through a crisis right now with uh, some of our young adults and our youth. And so uh, we have six months that we've now prepared for our uh, married couples ministry uh, around mental health. So those are some of the things that we are seeing, and those are some of the ways in which we are uh, choosing to address uh, what's happening currently. But our main goals are to uh, provide support um, through our monthly meetings um, and to leverage those resources of training and, and education and to ref, um, provide a referral system. Um, I see some of my uh, some of my colleagues on the phone on the on the call right now. Uh, Dr. Nance has been with us before, and uh, we've coupled and partnered with others that are on the line, and we are um, reaching out and referring where we need to. Uh, so the Halliburton uh, Foundation has been working with us in a, a particular situation that we're going through right now, and uh, that's where we see our strengths and um, the way we are going to continue to move forward. And we, knew, we know we're going to have to be flexible and fluid uh, in this very, very uh, challenging time. Thank you, Pastor Turnley. That's, uh, that's a great way to pivot in a pandemic, Dr. Pui said. Um, incredible. Others, what are, you, what are you encountering and how are you responding? Hi. Francis Smith, Dean of the Zanwesley Homes Junior Community Outreach Center. Um, basically, we are encountering a lot of emotions, um, breaking down of that emotional system on how our clients are dealing with this transition. Um, one of our signature programs, which is low voltage, that we do a training and placement uh, many of our students are dealing with the fact of now how do I manage a day-to-day -day life with kids at home or maybe staying with parents and other family members. And so we teach what is called emotional intelligence. We go through a module that deals with resiliency. And in emotional intelligence, uh, our training deals with the ability to identify and manage your emotions on a daily basis. In our course, for our students, we also deal with therapeutic wellness, which is being able to write a journal. Um, and that seems to help a lot if you can't get in touch with a therapist or if you can't get in touch with those resources are you still on track? Are you still doing or meeting the day-to-day -day goals that we help set in the beginning? It's not that you divert from it, but it means that you have to go back and reassess or reanalyze 
where you are now and where you need to go. Um, case in point, many of our, our Lobocha students were placed on jobs in the construction industry and some of the work has been scaled back. So that meant what? Economically, they had to transition. So in our increments of success class, we taught them you can now focus on a different aspect of your economic stability plan. Instead of that active income, let's look at maybe you need to do business with Amazon. Um, there may be a product or service that you could sell. So getting them to, one, get in touch with their emotions. This is not the time to panic, but the time to pivot. Two, let's go ahead and reset. And, and I tell every one of our students, this is a great time to reset. Don't, you know, don't um, get so emotional that you can't manage your feelings because a lot of our individuals were formerly incarcerated. So one that came to us with stigma, but as we say, we're a house of refuge at Frazier House. Your past does not matter to us. It's not how you start, but how you finish. We want you to finish strong. In order for you to finish strong, we now need you to put the tools that we taught you in place. Let's talk about it, journal about it. Even if you have a down day, even if you didn't accomplish it, get back up again. And that's one of the keys to our success right now. And then here's what happened. As we took our students through it, then we got family members and friends and cousins and other people to want additional training from us that we provided to our um, students and their families. Thank you, Francis. So we have this component of emotional intelligence that uh, is helping those that are going through training and have gone through it be able to deal with um, access to kind of coping strategies that are needed for this time. That's, that's incredible. Um, Others, Lori, Mike. Yeah, so I can speak. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker on staff at Christ United in Plano. And so I can speak from a therapist standpoint of clients that I'm seeing. Uh, I see church members, but I also um, see people out in the community for private counseling. Of course, everything's being done um, virtually now, which is not my preferred way to do counseling. But um, a lot of my clients have adjusted to that, which is great. So I can still see them and talk to them during this time. Um, I'd say probably we've are as mentioned that the top things that I'm seeing are a lot of anxiety and stress just around the unknown, not having control over what's going on. Uh, how do we know what the future is gonna look like? Um, lots of concerns about job and finances. I've had clients that have lost their job and of course they're worried about that. Um, <clears throat> we also have a lot of uh, parents that are under a lot of stress and anxiety right now. Um, and maybe Andrew, you're one of them because I heard a little one in the background there when you were talking. So maybe you know where I'm coming from with this. But um, just trying to work, do their job. Uh, a lot of them work from home and also managing the kids. And there's a lot of tension also with the couples together, particularly couples that maybe were already struggling and then they're under you know, the stress and, and together 24 seven. And it's, it, it puts a lot of strain on families right now. I also see a lot of anger, um, depression, sadness, frustration. Uh, I've noticed that as the weeks go by, this gets harder and harder. I think a lot of my clients were doing okay and church members were doing pretty well uh, the first couple of weeks. But as we get into April and now we're into May and we don't know what summer's gonna look like, um, I, I see a lot more and I'm hearing a lot more anger and frustration over the situation. And, um, you know, summer, now that we've lost spring, you know, our summer is going away. We recently had to cancel VBS, which uh, we hated to do that. Uh, mission trips and things like that, I, I guess are all on hold or maybe even canceled. And then of course, vacation plans. I have students that are worried about what school is going to look like in the fall. Um, I have a lot of... Uh, people dealing with grief right now over losses that they've experienced, whether it's um, graduation has been a big one, obviously for our seniors and also for college seniors. Um, 
I have a client that is expecting a baby and, you know, just her whole pregnancy has, it's her first pregnancy. So it's been very different than what she had dreamed it was going to be like. And that's been hard for her and, and hard for other people. All these little losses that people are experiencing that these milestone celebrations and things that they're kind of hard to get back. So uh, I spend a lot of time empathizing with my clients, uh, normalizing what they're feeling, letting them know they're not alone. Uh, what they're feeling right now is it's, it's what we, how we would expect to feel and in a situation like this under all this uh, stress and anxiety of the unknown. Um, so sort of normalizing those emotions, talking about them. Uh, some, some of my clients have had depression and anxiety before. They know what it feels like. So helping them have some awareness around if your issues from the past are starting to ramp up again, how will you know that? What will it look like? And what is your um, safety plan to, to get help if you start to notice that you're um, you know, going down that same road of, of depression or anxiety that you've had before? Um, working on coping skills. That's a lot of what I do also, uh, talking about, uh, we come from a strengths perspective as far as challenges that you've been through in the past and we've all had them in life. We've all had loss, we've all had hard times. Uh, how did you get through those? Those same strengths that helped you before will help you now. So let's dig deep and call on those. And then also making sure that we have other coping skills to help us. Um, and then doing those self-care things that we need to do, finding the time to do them. Uh, connections are important with other people. I tell people, you know, and a, and a lot of my clients are getting better about that as far as recognizing the importance of that and staying in touch with everybody. I do have some clients that aren't comfortable with um, virtual type of connecting. So that's been harder, particularly for our seniors. And uh, just as a congregation, we have been reaching out to them more with phone calls. And I know Mike can talk about that a little bit more, but uh, just checking in with them on a regular basis. Some of them have family around, so so they're okay, but we have some that live alone and maybe don't have that support nearby. So we do, I do worry about if we're reaching everybody and, and um, if we're able to help them, you know, through this time, the way they need to be helped. We've done, uh, we've done podcasts, um, which have been good. We put them on our website. Uh, we've, of course, we live stream. Um, we've added a service during the week. We have a weekly update from our uh, pastor. Uh, we do videos on social media. Um, I've done some on for parents on the on the children's uh, Facebook page, things like that. Just um, encouraging things, what to do, um, how to feel better, how to reach out for people. I think just letting. Uh, church members know that we're there for them and, and how they can connect with us is, is really important right now. That's, that's the biggest thing, but a lot of concerns over um, as each week goes by, it gets a little bit tougher. I think for people, I've had some comments about people noticing that they're drinking more and just having a hard time, just really struggling, I think, to get through this. So um, I'm glad that I'm there to be able to do counseling. Um, and a lot of people know that I'm there and, and reach out to me, but um, I, I do feel like we need to, we need to be doing more, I think, as a, as a church, both with our congregation and, and out in the community. Thank you, Lori. Um, and, and Mike, um, what are you seeing? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, as a care ministry director at Christ United, we provide a lot of care ministry opportunities and two of probably the most significant trends that I've been seeing these past two months results from, uh, firstly, our grief support. Um, I've noticed that those who have uh, recently suffered a loss and are grieving, this grief is further impacted by their isolation and their loneliness, uh, resulting obviously from the pandemic. So that provides a lot of opportunities to reach out and be creative in how we can um, get through the isolation and help them deal with their grief, whether it's through uh, a Zoom class uh, for grief support, uh, frequent pastoral care conversations, and the like. Uh, another major area that I've seen impacted is through hospitalizations, where a lot of uh, individuals are, again, isolated and very lonely. Uh, through surgery, procedures, therapy, rehab, whatever the case may be. So again, we have to be creative in how we connect and stay connected to these individuals and their families 
because it's not just the individuals, but it's also their families that are also struggling uh, and struggling with um, the, the losses and the hospitalizations. So um, looking at a lot of different creative ways to handle uh, the connection points with these individuals, regardless of where they are and what struggles they're facing um, at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we're trying to wrestle with um, the fact that COVID-19 is generally impacting uh, Black, African-American, Indigenous, person of color communities far worse than others. Um, and this is a, a systemic justice issue um, that's impacted by decades and centuries of, of injustice. Um, but I wonder if any of you can speak to how you see that at work in your own context of, of doing this ministry. Francis Smith, okay. So for us, uh, it was very challenging because many of the people in the community did not practice uh, what will I say, uh, quarantine, uh, dis distancing. And so at making, helping them understand and educating them. See, um, for, for the community was, you know, it really doesn't make a difference. So we had to really go in and break it down and explain to them, this is real, this is not, uh, a false alarm because the community is very skeptical of the government and you know I'm just being real with you all so explaining to them the need to wear masks explaining with to them the need for them to wash their hands but explain to them in a way where they would really engage and understand so we had to literally um I had to have a lot of conversations just with different people one-on-one -on -one so that they could understand the seriousness of, of COVID-19, what it meant, um, so that they could, they needed a trusted face, in other words. And I think sometimes um, church leaders um, have to be that trusted face and come forward and do calls, like Zoom calls with other uh, church parishioners so that people can understand this is the real deal. You understand? When you just hear it from government leaders, it doesn't, you know, it's like, okay, they're just trying to keep me in my house. Something must be going on. The 5G conspiracy was coming out. You understand? But if you had a trusted face in front, it would have made a difference. People would have reacted differently. You understand what I'm saying? Because of the trust factor. We're trusted in the community. Because we're trusted in the community, we started getting bombarded with calls. I had to say, this is the real thing. This is not a conspiracy theory. Because the first thing that came up was the 5G cell towers. So as we started educating, even Baylor Scott and White, we're doing a luncheon and learn with them later in June. We had to, you know, we sort of got together and said, okay, how do we now go in and educate the community? Because they weren't following the rules in South Dallas. And as a result, the numbers were showing. And then when the grief started to hit, we got like the tidal wave of grief that just came in as a result, then everybody saw that the alarm bells went off and people started now taking this a little bit more seriously. So it's, it's, it's having that trusted face. And I think um, what I think as people of faith, we have to maybe tell uh, our leadership and government we need some other trusted faces out front to say this is a real deal, okay? 
Well, uh, some of the things that we have been battling through is the mixed messages that are being touted in the media. And uh, we're now having to go behind, like Francis said, and uh, be supportive leaders to try to convey the message that we know will be safe and helpful to our community. Um, and so what we've been trying to do as a pastoral staff is to model what it is that we believe are safe practices. And so we, we have not been hesitate, we have not hesitated to wear a mask. We have not hesitated to wear gloves. We have tried to practice even social distancing, even in, as we go forth in our worship celebrations that are now being held virtually. Uh, whenever we're in the building um, at, on campus, uh, we're practicing those uh, modeling matters that we believe are important. So uh, vicariously, those messages we believe are getting through to our congregation. Uh, when, we, when, when we Zoom with them, when we have, and we're making connection points, we're doing ministry um, the same in such that we are having, still having Sunday school. We're connecting in every point that we have generally normally done. Um, so it's building a comfort level that we can connect and we can see each other. And we also have now started uh, talking to our congregation about what it is that they're experiencing and what their fears are all about. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is with our students, uh, the digital divide is real. And we are trying to find a way uh, to help bridge that digital divide. So our, um, our student ministry is uh, reaching out in ways to make sure that we have uh, hot spots around uh, for our students that do not have hot spots in our community. We have three schools that we uh, partner with and we've adopted and we're uh, trying to make sure that those students have hot spots uh, because everybody doesn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, we're trying to make sure that parents are able to be connected. Um, not just through the school system. Be, uh, the school system, as you know, will have a lot of buffers and, and ways in which they uh, protect students. And so there are times when parents need access in ways that students do not. So we're trying to find ways to build um, that bridge um, in the great digital divide. And we're also finding that people are still afraid because they don't help have health care. So if they're having a regular event, a medical event, they're hesitating uh, to try to get help. And so it exasperates that situation. And uh, sometimes we have to really, really, really encourage them to reach out to their medical professionals, even in the midst of this pandemic, to handle matters that are not COVID related, but because of what's happening with COVID can be exasperated. Um, our care ministry is, um, has reached out to over 900 people now, I believe. Um, just to make sure that they are connected. Um, and when they get a phone call from their pastor encouraging them uh, in, in what's happening in their homes, it does bring another level of uh, not only relief, but uh, as I heard so often uh, in the conversation, their grief is touched um, just like we would if we were comforting them in other ways. Uh, so our, we, we partner in the mental health ministry with our, with our care pastors and our care ministry. And uh, you know, we are now working through all, all of the various different ways that we're now doing funerals. Funerals in an African-American community are extremely important. And we are finding that we cannot do those funerals in the ways that we have. So we've been Zooming funerals. Uh, we've been trying to touch um, our families in all the ways that we possibly can to let them know that we are still there for them. Dr. Paula Dobbs Wiggins is a part of our mental health um, task force and ministry. And uh, so we're getting real um, real time messages from Parkland Hospital about what is happening there and how we can be a better support um, to our community through that avenue. So uh, we're trying to stay abreast of it, but it is a hard, hard deal to wrap your arms around right now. Andrew, one of the other areas of care ministry of Christ United is the assisted living ministry where we serve uh, several local assisted living communities. 
And again, it's this theme of isolation, loneliness, and obviously these communities have been hit very hard with the pandemic as well. And this cuts across all racial, ethnic, socioeconomic status lines. So what we're trying to do with that is uh, the theme of connection and staying connected, whether it's through Zoom Bible studies, uh, frequent pastoral care, phone conversations. A lot of these individuals don't have any family or friends in the area. So this pastoral connection is probably the only uh, hopefully meaningful connection that they do have. Uh, we also have our weekly devotionals that we send. Uh, we help them set up with live streaming for our weekly worship services. So these are points of contact to an otherwise sometimes forgotten community, um, local community. So we're, we're continuing to be creative in, in uh, setting up those connection points uh, with the, uh, the elderly and the senior communities uh, through assisted living. Mike, thank you for that. What we have also seen is that uh, it's important for us to continue with our conference lines. Now, Zoom is very helpful for many, but for our seniors, they're not always comfortable with that. So we have a practice for, uh, for years now with our prayer line, and we've converted our prayer line into many different things now because they're familiar with our prayer line. We're on it two times a week. And so now we're also broadcasting our live worship experience through our prayer line where our seniors can just dial in to something that they're already very comfortable with. And we have seen that to be very successful as well. That's great. And uh, along with that, we do frequent uh, either weekly or biweekly what we call care calls to our seniors who, again, may not be comfortable with the modern technology that Zoom or Facebook Live offers. So these care calls are a very uh, personal and intimate touch point with them. Uh, as, and also them with their prayer needs as well. Andrew, something else that I wanted to add that um, we do at Christ United, we have a, under our Serving Others, we have a program called Project Hope, and that's our uh, family assistance program. I'm the director of that program. So one thing that I've started, most of my clients in the program are uh, single moms, and uh, a lot of them are African American or Hispanic. Uh, they have no family support in the area. Uh, so we've been doing um, online Zoom parenting support calls every Sunday afternoon, and that's been a huge, a huge help to them, I think, just to feel connected and, again, kind of normalizing what they're going through, getting the message across, because as was mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes there's that um, hesitancy to believe what's going on. Is this real? Um, so kind of uh, doing some education around that and, and encouraging them. We have been um, making sure they have, that their kids have the tools that they need to do their schoolwork, whether it's uh, supplying them with um, a used computer that we've refurbished, making sure that they got their Chromebooks at school that they were supposed to pick up, things like that. Um, supporting the parents as much as we can with uh, you know, single moms, it's, it's, it's really tough anyway. And then to be working from home and, and managing the kids and the schoolwork, it's, it's really hard. So I'm checking in with them at least a couple of times a week just to give them emotional support, tell them they're doing a great job. Um, we know that it's hard. Uh, we can get through this. We're here for you. Call me if you need anything. And, and it's, it's made a huge difference to our parents during this time. So I wonder if we can switch gears here for a minute. <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> Pick me up, Daddy. I know, I know. Um, so I wonder if we can switch gears here for a minute and uh, and hear from uh, Dr. Brad Schwal about some of the resources and and things that this conversation is bringing to mind for him. Uh, Brad is the uh, uh, President and CEO of the Center uh, for Integrative um, Psychology and Counseling here in Dallas. Uh, you may have known it as the Pastoral Counseling Center 
uh, previously. Um, and Brad's been a great resource for us trying to think through how do we go about equipping our churches for the kind of, um, I think it is one of the momentous Institute um, interviewees in that article in the Dallas Morning News said uh, a tsunami of mental health concerns that's coming. So Brad, what, what does this bring to mind for you and, and what would you share? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And really, I'm going to summarize what I've heard each of those who've already spoken uh, shared and how it is so crucial. Uh, before that, it is just as important to take measures to address mental health. Um, as we focus on the coronavirus and, and the impact that it has on us physically, um, uh, my hope is that from this, we can have just as much regular conversation about mental health. Uh, one thing that has impressed me about what you are doing is really the, the directive has been that we be uh, physically different uh, or distanced, physically distanced. Um, you have remained socially connected, absolutely. And, and that is just really, really impressive and inspiring. Um, it's been fun and inspiring to see the creativity uh, that you have displayed and others have displayed in staying connected. It's interesting to see, as Reverend Turnley said, that uh, attendance may even be up because there's a, a sort of a sense of privacy in being able to, to watch and reaching new people. So, so while we've had to be physically distant, um, you all are demonstrating that we can still be relationally connected and mental health is a life and death issue. Depression can lead to death, can lead to death from mental illness, suicide. And so my hope is that we can continue to share and talk and be open about mental health. Some ways that I've heard each of those who have spoken uh, approach the issue of mental health um, is one community and that is something that is at the core of the church and has been ever since the church began. You provide a sense of community uh, that is grace-filled, um, that is focused on validating everyone's concerns and that's something that I heard uh, Lori say and that is that your work has normalized the fact that it's okay to feel isolated. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. And I'll say something to each of you on that as well, that you as helpers, uh, you as caregivers, you as, as individuals who have resources, who have support, need to realize that you need your own support. Um, you may think, oh, I, I don't need it. You know, those I'm serving, they are the ones who need help, or I, I, I have no reason to feel overwhelmed or sad. No, you need to identify your own response to this, and you need your own support. So it is, it is common uh, for those who give care uh, to be more resistant to, to receiving it and recognizing it that you've been through a difficulty too. Um, there are different levels and different types of loss, um, but we all have experienced some form of loss in this. Um, so you have provided community, you have normalized emotions, uh, validated those emotions, and you can do that through sermons. You can do that by even coming up with uh, topics for your groups that focus on the different feelings that people will be having. Um, you've mentioned several things. I believe it, I believe it was you, Francis, talking about uh, the needs of parents and managing their children, which Andrew did just so beautifully there, um, that it's okay to have a crying child. You just take care of the crying child. Um, but the needs of parents, uh, the needs of, of couples and what they are going through, so focusing on that empathy for those felt needs. The other thing that I hear you doing is providing practical education. Um, Francis talking about resilience, emotional intelligence, Lori talking about um, the importance of uh, journaling. It may have been Francis or Lori um, talking about journaling 
um, and that as a practical tool. So there is information that can help people, and I hear you bringing that to people. Um, education can lessen fear. Education can help to build coping skills. Um, so developing those, those habits um, that can help us to be well uh, day after day, and that, that is something that I do think that this is bringing about um, is what, what do we do to take care of ourselves each day? Um, you know, personally, uh, a part of who I am is my relationships. And so not being able to interact with my colleagues. So who am I uh, without that interaction, without that feedback in a non-virtual way, but in a in-person real way? Um, another uh, issue has been what is our purpose? Um, having to change our routine. Um, certainly, we haven't we haven't um, abandoned our purpose, and in some ways, each of you, there's an intensified call to your purpose because you've had to find new ways to to do that. Um, but I think some of those two philosophical factors of who we who are we when we're not with others. Who are we when we don't have our regular routine in which we have more tangible ways of, of fulfilling our purpose? Um, some important things that I also hear you doing are helping people uh, with those milestones. We depend on ritual. We depend on uh, those times in our lives where we are celebrating or even grieving a loss. And so I'm inspired by the creative ways that you have been doing that. Graduation, uh, uh, funerals, um, all of that is just such a loss. And you are on the front lines there helping people find ways to celebrate those. And I keep thinking that there may be other ways to retroactively celebrate some of these milestones when we can be together. Um, but those definitely are our losses. Um, and, and then finally, I like what you have said about that reset. It is a time when we can reset our priorities and reset how we do things. Um, I uh, feel um, in some ways more connected to those with whom I serve uh, because we've had to find different ways to connect. Um, I, I sent the postcard of a picture of myself just so everybody would remember me because I, I, don't, I don't like not being with them. Um, so I, I had to wave at them through the snail mail in addition to our, our uh, virtual meetings. Um, some, some practical matters that I, I do want to bring up in, um, we do at the center want to be a resource to you. Um, one of our therapists, Kimberly Pearson, was honored to speak um, to a leadership group in pastoral care at St. Luke's on um, helping with grief. Um, she also produced a video on helping with grief that I'll make sure that um, Andrew has that he can uh, share with you. Um, we do have a YouTube channel now where we are sharing videos um, on family life. Um, those videos also are in English and Spanish. Um, I've been able to do a number of Channel 8 interviews that have been on, that we have on our website as well. So at the center, we do want to provide help with um, education, uh, with resources that inform. And so this also is an invitation to you that we are here uh, for that and want to help in any way that we can. So one, one big issue um, that is, I believe, a justice issue, and that is access to mental health care. And our goal at the center is to increase access in a number of ways. Um, one is geographically, being located within communities. We have 31 locations, and a number of those are in Methodist churches. Um, for example, uh, First United Methodist Richardson, First United Methodist Garland, Garland First United Methodist Waxahachie, uh, treat Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound. And so by being where people live, work, play, and pray, 
we make it easier to get counseling. Because if you think about our days during non-quarantine days, uh, we're at work, we're picking up kids, we're at church, we're at home. So we have this travel pattern, and our belief is that the closer we can get to where people are, the easier it is for them to obtain counseling. Um, so by having locations from McKinney to Waco, from Rockwall to Arlington, uh, the idea is that we can cover as much of a, an expanse as, as we can. Um, someone just commented on rural areas. I hope uh, that our move to telecounseling during this shelter in place um, is going to be something that is a springboard um, to resource more churches in rural areas. And uh, there may be those on this call that can help with that. Um, as Lori said, we prefer in-person counseling, and that is why we have offices in McKinney and Waco and, and Rockwall, and, and uh, we, we want to go to where people are. Um, we had done telecounseling before this, uh, but, but we are finding that it is a helpful tool. Our clients have continued with counseling. We have had not had a drop-off in counseling. And that says several things. One, it says that there's a need and that they are, um, that those we are, we're already serving uh, perhaps have had an increased need for support. Um, it also says that they are open to the idea of telecounseling. Um, it even has helped with cancellations. People are already uh, where they are and they're not having to travel. Um, they're not having to take that time away to get to the office. Uh, so I do, I am excited about how telecounseling can help us with, with access. Others, other issues related to access are um, our language. Um, we have 12 Spanish speaking therapists. Um, that is important to us. Um, we always work to be culturally competent and um, our, our goal is to have a diverse staff. Our goal is to meet a wide range of needs at, uh, across communities. Um, and, and by the way, you can help us too. Sorry, I keep on asking for ways y'all can help. Uh, we, we want therapists who are high quality, have an interest in faith and spirituality, are interested in, in reaching uh, diverse cultures and, and different groups in different areas and different specialties, children, teens, adults, um, working with um, the elderly. And so if you know people who are uh, licensed therapists or even those in training, send them our way because we have a great team. We have close to 40 clinicians, um, but developing strong professionals is, is important to access as well. So access related to cultural competence, related to language, um, very, very key. Uh, then we have the issue of insurance and finances. Um, many do not have insurance or adequate insurance to cover counseling. Uh, we address that in several ways. One, we partner with other nonprofits obtain funding from foundations or funding that those uh, partner nonprofits have found to have therapists on site at those nonprofits because we believe that community members trust that organization and therefore if we're collaborating, they're more likely to trust us and then therefore follow through on that referral. Um, Wesley Rankin Community Center, uh, Kim is on this call, and I understand or know, believe I, is, it's accurate that she's on their board. Um, uh, but at uh, Wesley Rankin Community Center, having counselors there, working with the other staff, helps it to be more likely that those um, who are suggested or recommended counseling will take advantage of that. We just started a, a project with Texas Health Resources that has allowed us to be in the Pleasant Grove area, and we're partnering with the Salvation Army there. Um, we have 11 different nonprofit sites, North Dallas Shared Ministries, 
several locations in West Dallas. Um, would love to connect with the Bethlehem Center. Uh, would love to learn more about your work at CARE in Plano. Bottom line, we want to come alongside um, other organizations who are meeting needs and we complement and supplement that by addressing mental health needs. Um, I believe that what we do in the church and in nonprofits, not all of it needs to be uh, professional therapy. Um, we need not separate the role of the church and say the church, no, the church can't handle that. No, the church can handle mental health needs. Um, our belief in God, and one thing that this pandemic for me has brought up and reminded me is we're not in control. Um, I can't do it alone. I need God, and I've learned that in my life in other instances. So we can't, sell, uh, we can't separate spirituality from our emotional or relational well-being. They are interconnected. Um, but we must be aware that there are those times when professional support can help. Um, uh, someone who is knowledgeable about mental health, about psychology, um, understanding depression as a physical illness. Um, I believe in many ways, um, I know I have had times throughout this where there has been this kind of a depleting because I do get fed from being um, with our team. Um, and that's emotional, but depression also has a physical component to it. So when symptoms, when uh, that, that loss of joy, when that sense of despair happens over time at a strong intensity, and it happens over time for a longer duration, that's a sign that we may need support. So likewise with anxiety, um, worry, um, having difficulty shutting down our brain. Um, when that happens, and for anxiety, we diagnose it based on um, a, long, a, a longer length of time, because it's natural to have nervousness, but bottom line, as with depression, with anxiety, intense symptoms over time is a sign um, that support may be, may be needed. Um, and, and our goal with that is to help it be a part of um, a part of the work of the church, a part of the work of nonprofits. Um, so back to the issue related to access um, with non-insurance, those who don't have insurance, we have our partnerships. Uh, we also do work to have an adjusted fee scale and we work to find resources that help those who may not be at one of our community partners. Um, we have been very grateful to the Center for Missional Outreach for a uh, matching grant that they offered for Giving Tuesday Now, and that has been um, so helpful to have some funds available uh, for those who have lost jobs and lost insurance. So we see those who have insurance, who have resources, uh, we see those through those transitions if they do lose a job, and then we work to go into communities where traditionally there is less access due to uh, a lack of insurance or inadequate insurance. So um, that is definitely a part, a part of our mission. Um, so a couple of things before we go on, Andrew had set aside time for question and answers. Um, we uh, are taking new clients through our regular phone number, our website, and we are available for counseling. It is telecounseling, but as I said, we have created systems to make that as relatable, as approachable as possible. Um, we take and we see people who have insurance. We work with people um, who, who are struggling financially or who do not have insurance. Um, when you refer, and we'll send you a link with information, uh, we want you to know that we are in all these different locations, but really all you need to know is just our phone number and our website uh, because we work with each person who calls to find the best place and the best therapist for them. Um, so we are here and ready to receive those who you believe may need counseling. Never hesitate to contact me. Um, call me through the main office. 
uh, look up my uh, email, find me, you can find me. Um, I'm happy to talk to you directly. Um, we have a good solid network of church locations, um, always open to finding areas and churches who do want to increase their emphasis on mental health. Um, we have talked about ways with St. Luke's, with Kimberly Pearson, for example. Um, she has an office at Cliff Temple Baptist in Oak Cliff, so we try to find one of our locations that has sort of a radius of reach. Um, now with telecounseling, we can see anybody anywhere, but certainly we're going back to in-person counseling. Um, so referral, looking for ways to collaborate as far as even location, um, and then also keeping in mind educational opportunities, training for staff. Um, so I typically don't do as much of a uh, commercial like that, but I care about what y'all do. And um, I, I want us to be able to be partners uh, with you. Um, you know, Kim Myers had a, has a podcast and I was able to be on her podcast uh, a while back. And so even before COVID-19, um, I am aware that all of y'all do uh, work creatively to reach people. So um, those are my thoughts, more we could say, but I want to allow for the, the flow of conversation, Andrew. I also re recommend bubbles uh, for your mental health. Uh, very uh, helpful. Yeah, and that's also helpful in two-year-old Sunday school. I did learn that, you know, at the end when the parents are all coming to pick up their kids, get out the bubbles so they can mesmerize, and then everything's great. So little bonus tip. Thank you, Andrea. I, I do love the good, good bubbles. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, so I wonder, um, either using your chat feature or... You have the ability to uh, unmute yourself if you would like to um, ask a question or share another thought that comes to mind throughout this conversation. Uh, this is Mary Miridi uh, from Oasis Global UMM, and um, I deal mostly with Africans, uh, mostly people from Kenya, and uh, they are type of the people also that um, don't want to expose themselves to the people that they know and they don't know the people that they know to know what they are going through. So I feel fortunate that uh, Dr. Shawo uh, spoke. I, I feel that uh, if I can connect with him and connect my people with him, it could be of help or his staff could be of help because they don't know them. He don't, so he, 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 they know that he doesn't know people that know them. So to be able to, you know, to leak the information or something like that. And uh, so I, I, I feel privileged and I feel excited about this. Um, I am, a, beside being a clergy in the conference, I'm also a chaplain with the military. And so I deal, I know how to gauge them because I deal with a lot of uh, mental issues with the military soldiers and um, on reserve. And sometimes I, before quarantine, I used to visit them in their homes because they have uh, their civilian jobs when they are not uh, with us. And so I, I have seen a lot of different behaviors that when I observe my people, I can be able to sense what is going on. So I would be happy to connect so that I can start introducing them to uh, your organization and so that you can see how they can benefit from it. B very good. And, and Mary, thank you for that. And that does bring up a, a point. Um, know those to him, to whom you refer. Um, 
there, there needs to be a sense of trust and you need to feel good um, about referring. And the closer the connection is, the more likely that individual will follow through. So Mary, what, what you're talking about, um, we get so specific as making sure you know um, whom you can speak to at the center. Now, you know, we have a client services team that can all be of help, but sometimes we might say, um, here's one person, ask to speak to this person. Um, often we might even set up funds that are available to make um, that initial counseling easier. But, but bottom line, um, one key to getting help to people and the encouragement is that each of you knows those to whom you are referring um, because it can increase the chances, chances that somebody will follow through with that. And there are, are processes that we can set up to make it easier. Um, but bottom line, um, have that knowledge. And I believe that creates a more successful referral because counseling is, I mean, it does take courage. People don't know what to expect. They don't want to know others are struggling. And, and you know, quite honestly, I think that's uh, the case even with those who know counseling is great. You know, um, that when it comes to us individually, um, it sometimes can be uh, daunting. So thank you for that, Mary. I have an observation and want to ask about, I don't know how uh, significant it is, but I've noticed that the people that are participating in this um, Zoom meeting, this conference about mental health are mostly women. And so I'm wondering what that means um, in terms of how we're responding as, as, a, as a church and um, just, you know, just, just curious about that. Um, Francis Smith Dean, we see 90% of our clients are men, um, but women are on the front line in our organization and we're nurturing, but you have, your point is well taken. Uh, and I have a session, a crying session for all of my um, low voltage students. When things are, you know, seem over the top, I just allow them to cry and break down so that they can still go through that, what, what I call emotional withdrawal. But it just happens that we have a, a team and a staff of women. 90% of the people that we see are men. And um, they just, we're nurturing. And, and, and that's, about, that's all I can really say. We're just a nurturing group of uh, individuals. And this is my, um, as far as Christ United is concerned, um, we have a very uh, robust group of Stephen ministers. And I would say it, it's an equal uh, ratio of female to male Stephen, Stephen ministers, uh, which tells me that there is the need uh, just as much for men for, uh, for spiritual support and guidance uh, as there are women. It's been very, very successful as far as how we've been able to uh, assign those male as well as female Stephen ministers uh, to the needs as they've come up. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, the males in our in our congregation are open to allowing that that spiritual support and assistance as much as uh, as the women are. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And we also are we also are having some questions um, via our chat about being able to mark um, with rituals like I think you mentioned Brad uh, graduations end of the year. Um, does anybody have any recommendations about that? For examples. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing, and we have it scheduled, I believe it's May the 24th, uh, for our, our graduates and any graduate that would like to present, uh, we're going to have a, a big pictorial collage of all of those that are graduating from our community, um, uh, our church, 
and they're going to share with us what high schools they're graduating from and what their future is going to look like for them. And we're just going to stream that all through our, um, throughout our uh, morning worship on that Sunday. And then we're going to invite them into our new St. Luke Community Cyber Cafe, uh, which we do over uh, our prayer line so that they can come in and celebrate their time with us. And we as a community share that uh, time of celebration with our 2020 graduates. Uh, we're doing a time in our worship service. Um, I think it's the first weekend in June where we're going to um, pause and have families, you know, lay hands because graduation is vital and important. And those people, those kiddos, those seniors need to be loved on deeply. But the kindergartner who is ending their kindergarten year also, we believe, needs to have an end cap. And so we're, we're, we're doing a prayer time um, where we're just, you know, asking families to lay hands on them and recognize that, you know, and look them in the face and say, you are now a first grader and we're so proud of what you've accomplished and what you're about to do. Um, we're hoping to do some drop offs at um, like the fifth graders who will be sixth graders, like give them like a t-shirt for our youth group or something, you know, we're just kind of, so I was just wondering if anybody else had different, um, ideas of how they're helping. We're also, um, a part of that is the those who are retiring from the school system. Um, it's not a great year to retire, you know, no cake and punch. So, um, we're, we're adding that to the prayer list also at, for that moment. You know, we, um, at First Sherman, we were really struggling with the preschool. Um, our preschool took their spring break and then they never came back. And so um, one of our staff members had a four-year-old and was just in my office one day bawling, like, <laughs> because we still go to the office um, a couple of hours um, a week. And so she came in my and she said, my, her daughter was not going to do her pre-K walk. <laughs> so... Um, what we did, and we have a really creative preschool director who uh, we spent two days um, with every student basically coming in at their assigned hour and their parents were in the sanctuary and they walked down the aisle and their little cap and gown um, and had a graduation picture from preschool taken, right? And so, um, and they videoed it, and now every parent has the video of all the kids walking. Uh, so, uh, you know, and it was just enough for some of those parents who, for whom it's like their last child in the preschool or it's their first child in the preschool. They were the ones that really wanted this. Uh, and it was just that little thing. And it took us two days to do it. And it was basically eight hours a day getting all those kids at their, in their slot and, um, but I think it's important even for those littles, right, and the parents of those littles to have some kind of normalcy um, because for them that was normal. That was the expectation even though they hadn't been back to school. Um, and we are doing the um, high school, you know, thing. I wanted them, you know, it was interesting because I actually offered the kids to do like a three-minute video each but none of them wanted to videotape themselves. They were happy with a picture and some details. Um, but we are making care bags for each one of those kids and we will drop it off at their homes. And, um, you know, the response from the kids was what you expect from the kids, but it was the parents who were just so appreciative um, and so excited that, you know, we had thought this through a little bit. Um, but I think it's important that even though it's not normal, it feels like the normal thing you would do for those kids. And I think that's what parents want almost more than the kids is the sense of my kid has still accomplished something and the church that they grew up in is going to acknowledge that. And that for us has been really important for people. So. Denise, you make a good point. I've, I've actually seen a lot of parents that are taking these um, uh, canceled graduations just as hard, if not harder than the, than the student themselves. They just, 
you know, especially if it's the first or last child, they've spent years just anticipating that event and, um, you know, it's, it's gone. So a lot of them who were very involved, especially the moms and dads who were very involved in the schools, very involved in planning proms and things like that, um, they're really taking it hard. So um, I like the idea that you had uh, of celebrating the seniors that way for the parents as well as for the kids. We, we had a recording of our, what would have our typical senior Sunday. And so we recorded it on Saturday at the church. And then um, without the students knowing, the uh, church members were invited to come right after that service. And they had a drive, the students all stood outside and there was a big sign, congratulations class of 2020. And then cars drove by and honked. And we had to drive by parade for the students as they uh, kind of kept their distance. Well, I want to uh, thank our guests who are here uh, with us today and um, uh, appreciate all the ideas uh, that you have generated, uh, all those that have been participants in the call. Uh, what we will try to do, what we will do, is create a, a notes document that will include uh, hopefully all of the links as we can get them that people have offered, uh, some of the ideas that people have offered and uh, post that online to the ntcumc.org webpage. You'll find that on the uh, missional outreach subpage, which is our center, uh, as well as the um, uh, coronavirus resources page that's on the main uh, page, and you'll see that immediately across the banner on the website. Um, so we'll offer that, and then an edited version of this uh, recorded video so that uh, if any of you want to go back and watch it for something that you might have missed or if you want to forward it to someone else that you think might be uh, it might be helpful for hope you'll do that uh, and if any of you uh, continue to have insights or connections that you'd like to share uh, please email me uh, or andy lewis um, uh, you can find my email address on the website or it's pfizer fi S-E-R at ntcumc.org. Um, and we will try to post those and get those out. And there's Andy Lewis's email address on the chat feature. Uh, so Andy, would you, uh, before we uh, depart, offer a word of prayer and benediction for us? Will, again, uh, thanks to all of our, uh, our speakers, um, Brad, thank you for being with us today and lifting up the resources at the center that are available to all of us. And um, I just I just want to send you forth before a formal word of benediction um, by saying that, I mean, as I look at each of you and your images on the screen and the names of those who are part of this call, um, I know many of you personally, um, you know, you have... Uh, gifts and you have a positional opportunity to uh, to meet needs in a really impactful way um, with regard to uh, again the, the mental health and relational stresses and strains that we've named and and so uh, i hope that you will embrace that uh, opportunity take that authority as we sometimes say um, there's a there's a lot a lot of good that uh, we all can do together so, um, so go forth with this benediction. I go forth and may the grace of our God, the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit empower us and strengthen us and unite us in the ministry moving forward. And may those in our community who uh, are in need of support and encouragement uh, find in us uh, friends who are generous with their gifts and time. Uh, may the Spirit move in and through us to bring healing to our world. I go in peace. Amen.